paper reading, like so based on some paper or it's your work? My my work. Ah, okay. I thought yeah. it's paper reading. No, no. Okay. That's great. Wenn du es mit meinem Handy abschickst, ja. ansonsten suche ich danach. So. EVH, das ist einfach ein so gutes Kürzel. Okay, let's wait for another. I, I just made a. Is, is, is Tobias or Max there? Not yet. Not yet. Because I'm giving out, an, I, I already have a subject for the next paper se reading seminar. Just talk to this, talk about this with Attila. I think I really like it to have it as a. But let's wait for Tobias and, and Max to join because probably, or be you. <laughs> <laughs> One of you guys will have to give that paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Natural adversarial observations sounds like predators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they will. Or, 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 or anti corona, anti vexas. <laughs> I'm, I'm naturally adversarial to anything that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will probably be a bit uh, disappointed by <laughs> I think you have to double click. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, people start to come in. Perfect. People are coming in. It's recording. Wonderful. So um, thank you very much again for coming to this to this uh, paper reading seminar. Um, Pia, who is just awesome, by the way, has again agreed to. <laughs> you're doing the seminar really good. Yes. <laughs> so so to to give us more insight into um, uh, adversarial observations and uh, uh, adversarial uh, uh, approaches in general to um, neural network based solutions, which is a very important problem in terms of making uh, natural uh, uh, um, neural network approaches robust against outside influences. And this is not just 
by malice, but a lot of the things that we see in, in general in observations from the outside, they don't fit to the model we have been training on. There, there can be just a lot of things that are happening that might, might put the model into a situation that was not in the initial training data and how this becomes robust in any sense. Uh, is, is an important field of research because just because the sun is reflecting from another car should not cause your car to crash against a tree or whatever. Yeah. So this is something important to, to take into account and I'm very much looking forward to this, to this um, uh, seminar. Um, after the seminar, I would like to, to uh, keep the people a bit in because I, I think these uh, paper reading seminars are really important and a, and a few of you have really been, been pushing this hard. Um, I think I would like to see more contributions to this, especially a broader contribution to this to really understand you know, uh, what we are interested in, what are seminal papers in our fields, or what are papers that could be of interest to others as well. For example, I have a suggestion for warm dense matter coming up after this, but I'm, I'm really sure others have much better insight. And I would, for example, love to see something from systems biology or see something from, from informatics in general that could be of interest and so on. And also, I would say this is a very great opportunity for young scientists to get into their own field. If they read the papers and the seminal papers anyways, which they should at some point, uh, <laughs> this is a, <laughs> just saying, hint, hint, notch, notch. This is a very good situation if you've read the paper anyways to actually present it to others because that's another step in, in, in understanding a paper. You can read a paper and then think you understood it and then you'd give a talk about it and then you realize, ah, oh, this is more complicated than I initially thought. So this is, this is a really good thing, especially for the young scientists here to, to also help themselves in understanding subjects better that are important for their own work. And now I stop read, stop talking and give the stage to Pia and thank you very much for preparing this. No problem. Um, so this is not actually a paper reading as we did before because I am presenting to you my midterm master thesis results. Well, which is almost and a paper <laughs> reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, to find spots for institute seminars is quite hard at the moment, and that's why I simply blocked the first possible date. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I'm I'm going to present you uh, the main work that I did for the past three months. And uh, to give you um, an overview on uh, what the actual scope of my master thesis is, is we have um, an Atari game. This is the game Enduro, for example. And we want to add something to this image we get from the game uh, to force uh, a reinforcement learning um, agent that has been trained to play the game almost perfectly to choose so, um, something different. So in the first image you see in the left, um, the agent chooses a suitable action, which is to go up to accelerate. Um, and in the perturbed image, uh, so the, the final image after the attack has been applied, and the agent chooses a different action, which is actually something that a normal player would not do at this state of the game. For young, for younger people, how is this game played? Um, so you have <laughs> an overall of, of, uh, of nine actions, and I will go into detail about this more, but okay. um, you you are the, the the player is the small white car in the right um, of the lane. You have to surpass the opponents and for each opponent you will get a point, a score. Um, and if you bump into the lanes, um, 
the player is not able for a few seconds to accelerate anymore and will be pushed into the lane a bit. Um, and if you don't reach the exact amount of opponents you have to surpass within one level, um, the, the game finishes. But no bananas. Yeah, no bananas. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no bananas and no question mark boxes. <laughs> yeah. But it was um, pretty, um, a pretty innovative game at the time. And it's not very uh, easy for reinforcement learning to, to learn the game. Uh, to give you a short summary about... Yeah, sorry, just a short question yeah. about the previous image. Um, uh, so I might have missed the actual perturbation. Is this visible somewhere or... Um, at the moment... Invisible? So on this slide, I just wanted to give you... Um, an overview of what we are going to do and we will dive into what the perturbation actually looks like um, in detail later. Okay. So to give you um, a short summary about what reinforcement learning actually is, some of you might have seen this slide before, um, we have our reinforcement learning agent uh, that plays the game which takes an action. And this action is applied to our game, the environment. And after the action is applied, the environment will uh, uh, return a reward and a new state to the agent. And this process is called Markov decision process. And this is how reinforcement learning in general works and what you can train on. The architecture of the net is we have um, a convolutional neural net uh, that takes each input image we get from, from the environment. So each state from the environment is uh, forwarded through um, the, uh, some convolutional layers. And in the end, um, we, have, we get the probability of which action is for all actions. We get the probability of all actions. And the action with the highest probability is chosen and then applied to the environment. We have the advantage stream, which tells um, the agent which action would be best in the current state. And the value stream um, decides if the current state we are in is actually a good state or a desirable state, which um, <laughs> is different than the original 2015 implementation of the first reinforcement learning agent for Atari. It has, been, uh, it has since been um, developed a bit further and uh, splitting uh, into an advantage and value stream for evaluation uh, has been very uh, good for Atari games because um, the agents are more robust and can be applied to several different games. So my reinforcement learning agent is originally trained on the uh, game Enduro. Um, I gave this talk uh, two weeks ago to my supervisors already and since then I have been able to finally train another agent on the game Breakout. That's why I added uh, yes. the movie to it. I was really good at both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, my trained agent for Enduro uh, scores on average um, 100, uh, 1,300 points, which is, um, so it reaches level four and an average human player reaches about uh, 310 points, which is the end of level two. Uh, and the breakout agent um, has a final score of 350 points. Um, an average human, human player would probably score around seven, uh, 75 points. Um, each of the Atari games has a different uh, amount of actions uh, it can perform for Enduro, it's nine actions. So the action one, for example, is accelerating, action zero is nothing, and action five would be to break and go right. 
um, may I ask here um, is I'm trying to understand like the technically how how you set up this framework and train. So is it that you uh, is the time somehow how is is the time in these Atari games is somehow discretized, right? So do you consider the discretized images of these time slices as as data? Um, or how, how do you so, take that information of the game into the neural net? So um, to keep the information over the past um, in the memory, um, the network actually um, gets as input a stack of four grayscale frames. Mm -hmm. So um, it doesn't only train on one frame for each training iteration, but, but on the past four. So the information about how uh, we got into this current state is somewhat included in the training process. Okay. So is there any differentiation happening in between? Does, or is it just interpolation then? Why do you need four steps? Um, it is only uh, to keep some kind of memory um, in the training process. I don't do anything further than stacking these four grayscale images of, of the frame, of each mm -hmm. frame, and um, shoving it into the, the network. Okay. And then it, it somehow learns that how it got there and what is actually a good next step. Mm -hmm. Okay, to give you a bit more details about adversarial attacks in general. Um, neural networks have been known to, that they can be tricked by slightly altered input images for quite some time now, so since 2014. Um, adversarial attacks have been applied in multiple ways to, to um, neural networks. And we can easily create these adversar uh, adversaries. So each frame, let's call it X, um, to the input model um, is forwarded through the network. And what we want to do is after that we added the perturbation to each frame, we want the network to, to decide on another, um, on another action. So we have our action space, which is the um, set of classes, of, of possible classes. And we want the network to simply choose something else. And this method um, that I implemented for this is similar to the fast gradient signed method by Fellow from 2014, which is the most basic way to um, produce adversarial attacks. So to generate good perturbations, um, there are some constraints. The perturbation needs to be small so that humans don't recognize them. And they should cause a misclassification with high accuracy. But for Atari, some more constraints um, apply. Um, we want the perturbation to lead to a bad decision, not only a misclassification, because some adversarial attacks can lead to an even higher score because our network is not perfect. It sometimes misclassifies. And if we um, choose another action instead, um, the network can actually achieve higher scores after the perturbation is applied. But that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted the, the, my agent to fail. And that's why um, I decided to uh, constrain the perturbation on this. And yeah, it should lead to an overall lower score. And there are um, ways to calculate 
uh, adversarial attacks for um, for models in general. So um, the first is to to calculate for each input um, an own perturbation, which is very fast and very robust. Um, and yeah, but but we change it to only one action, which is not very natural for a game. So what I mean by this is if we take our game and do, and we change the action to be only one action, for example, breaking, then um, the episode we are going to, to play and that we as a human will see um, will be very, very boring because the agent is only breaking constantly. And then we can get suspicious. Okay, something is not working here. This might be wrong and it's not very stealthy. Um, another way would be to um, generate an attack that is uh, suitable for a whole model. So my agent, my model, is trained on the game and Duo. And you can create an attack specifically working for the whole game. So you only have one perturbation, which you can store into a file and then add on top of each and every frame. And it will lead to um, the, the agent not working. And still, we are only changing it to a specific action. And the same applies for the other approach. It will be a boring playthrough. We can change um, the, these methods to be not class specific, so to just change to a random action. So we only take the, um, the for example, the, the lowest likely action and train our attack to be uh, effective to, towards them. And to give you an example of what this looks like, actually. Um, this is for, for this specific frame. Uh, one perturbation I have calculated with my method, and it changes the, um, the original action, which is one, accelerate, to action five, which is break and write. And it works for all frames. So for all frames, this perturbation would be looking differently. So this is also heavily zoomed in. So um, just to make it visible for you, um, that you can see how this perturbation actually looks. But after it has been applied on the, on the frame, you can't see it. And this perturbation would be needed to, to um, to be calculated each and every time for each frame. But it's very fast, so it's basically a one shot. So what do you mean it works on every frame, but has to be calculated for every frame? The, the, the method works for every frame. Ah, the method works. Okay, so it's not the perturbation that I see that is applied to every frame, but this perturbation is recalculated for, for each new frame. Yeah, so this is each four, uh, each of the four grayscale frames, um, and this is the perturbation. It is added to the frame, and it has the same effect. Interesting. There are no cars. Yeah, at the moment there are no cars. And still, it breaks and goes to the right. Yeah. Because it somehow figures that in the perturbation is some pattern that leads to the decision, oh no, break. Okay. Yeah, and this is how it looks like. So it, it bumps into the lane. While bumping into the lane, it's, it's causing the player to, to go more into the, the middle of the lane, but it's always breaking right. And it doesn't look very natural. So instead of what we have seen in the beginning, how the game is played, this is just, yeah. But it's working, at least. <laughs> and and remind me, the, 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 
the criterion to to basically optimize was not to bump into another car. Is that or um, what was like the predefined goal to to which you optimize the weights in this? Um, for the attack or for the model for the model, playing? For the for the model playing. Um, the model is optimized on um, the Bellman equation, so it's um, optimized to maximize the future reward. Um, and what is the future reward? Or what the, the future reward is um, it takes the current state we are in and um, the next state. So um, it takes two images from the memory, the current state and the next state. And the reward um, that has been um, that has been returned for the action that is applied. Um, and it tries to estimate for every action, for every possible action in the action space, the future reward it gets in the next state. That's why it has to take two images. Mm -hmm. this, so this means the extra reward is to keep, keep playing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But not only keep playing, because uh, we can uh, play the game and have a zero reward overall. Mm -hmm. But only for surpassing opponents, uh, opponents it receives a, a positive reward. And by getting surpassed, it receives a negative reward. Okay. And that's why it tries to normally it would try to to surpass all the all the other cars. And this is an example for a universal attack. So in this case, um, this perturbation, if you save it and throw it on top of each transition. Um, you will be able to fool the network into taking the action break right. This is how the perturbation looks like for each grayscale frame. And this is the, the results on the game. So you are not able to, to see the perturbation. Yeah, and it's basically the, the same result. But uh, in this case, only with one perturbation added to each and every transition. So um, because this is not very promising, I decided to um, read further into the current literature, the current state of the art. And um, I've read about uh, a method called class discriminative universal adversary perturbation. And um, with this, method, I was able to lower the accuracy for multiple classes. And this makes sense for games, not only for Atari games, but for several other games. Um, you have to um, find a, a way to determine which actions do lead to positive rewards. And after that, you can simply um, try to, to lower the accuracy on these classes and maximize the accuracy on all other classes. Um, the uh, overall performance should be lower, but it should still be somewhat stealthier, this method, because um, you have this trade-off. Um, you can't lower the accuracy on all the classes. You have to somewhat keep, the, keep it up. Uh, for the other classes as well. And maybe to um, give you a bit of an insight, so the perturbation looks different in this case. Um, it always looks different when you uh, calculate it, of course. Uh, so this is trained on um, for and duo specifically, uh, and it um, changes the actions. So I targeted the actions accelerate, accelerate left and accelerate right, which are ex actions one, seven, and eight, um, to be any other action. And in this case, it works. So um, the action one 
is changed to ex action three, which would be right. So in this case, the agent would turn right. And also this perturbation, this single image uh, can be put onto each and every transition and it would work. This is how the perturbation looks like for the for grayscale frames. And this is the result. So how do you put the perturbation on? Because I, I literally don't see it in the video. So is it is it an XOR with with how how do you change this it's to be um addition? It's an, it's a simple addition and yeah. with very small values, so yes. I don't see the changes. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes you see it accelerates still because I uh, lowered the accuracy just a bit. But the overall uh, score, so over four test runs, four test runs, I know it's not much, but um, at this time I wasn't able to do more at the moment. I will do big test runs with over 100 tests as soon as I'm ready. Um, the accuracy for the targeted classes one, seven, and eight dropped by 60% while keeping the accuracy on all other classes um, up to 80% or 70%. Um, and this is, I think this is the attack that I want to have for my master thesis. And I think the, the most, Stealthy attack for games in general, I can produce with this. One, one question I have. So now you're attacking more than one cl class mm -hmm. and you're attacking those that have a high reward or at least non non-zero positive yeah. award, which means that in in the many cases where the the system itself decides to anyway do something that's not giving you a higher reward you're making it look natural while with some form of accuracy you're hindering those actions that would get a high reward which makes it look much more natural because it kind of gets harder once you become better you know that's mm -hmm. like that's that's like something that that you would naturally see in a game. Yeah. My question is how much would that be different to just a very randomized action? So you could also you could also fiddle with the accuracy of, of all the actions in a sort of uh, 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 randomized way that each time you decide on an action, you change this action accordingly to a certain probability you know yeah. that that would actually say okay whenever you do any action it's either strongly changed or or slightly changed maybe by 60 percent or only 10 percent or something and what you would assume by then is that any agent that wants to optimize this basically is stochastically graded in in their performance mm -hmm. and depending on how how strongly you affect the, the action, it would slow down the overall process anyways, because the other one tries to optimize it. And then when I go stochastically, I basically change the, the overall accuracy of the result. Would that be possible or would any agent that optimizes this at one point take the stochasticity into account? So saying, okay, once, once I have a con, it's like a controller that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. that's you, if you if you especially played those games after after being very good at it, you probably broke the controller and had to buy a new one every every six months. That was the standard, you know, because it was there were certain games that were designed to break those controllers because you you should buy new ones. You know? yeah. <laughs> and that was a general annoyance that you're stupid controller broke and then your accuracy and your your skills didn't matter much anymore yes so um of course i can perform um more training on the adversarial data which is then called adversarial training which is a whole new method to um, make agents more robust 
and it would learn to somehow work with the perturbation archive mm -hmm. and the um, stochastic method you you mentioned of lowering the accuracy randomly i mean i i can do this and this function i have created to um to calculate the perturbations you can change the targeted ad action for each mm -hmm. and every training one i mean that would because because randomness usually shows you it's it's random and we as as we as humans and as as players usually accept, uh, like you said, if you're always bumping into the right, I would assume that my controller is broken, you know? Yeah. It's somewhat, you know, it just bumps to the right and I would buy a new controller. But if I just see that my controller is kind of, you know, a bit off, I say, ah, oh, this is really hard and they programmed this shitty, but, you know, if I realize I buy a new controller and it's still that way, then I would maybe say, okay, something's odd here. Yeah, but, but in general, I would I would not realize that this is an attack, you know. Yeah, the the yeah, yes, but uh, in this case, you will never play the game yourself. I know. I'm just trying to translate this into something where I would say, okay, something that should not look like an attack. Yeah. Uh, Randomness usually doesn't look like an attack in many cases. Mm, I think yes, because it is very visual uh, that instead of the working agent, um, the agent is now a random agent. Okay. Because it doesn't score anything. It is really hard to score any point with random actions in a mm. at least. For other games, it's, it's different. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't make let it make random decisions. Mm -hmm. But I would degrade the accuracy of any mm -hmm. very good action mm -hmm. to a certain accuracy. So I would say oh. it still looks perfect, but it doesn't look like a perfect player. You know, it looks like the a more average human player, since yeah. each of the tasks it does, it does with less accuracy. But isn't this method actually doing what you what you already what you are saying? So I am lowering lowering the accuracy for the actions one, seven, and eight, mm -hmm. and the others are not so much affected. Okay, and do you do this randomly, or do you do this always with the same value, or, or do you, are you taking it from a distribution, so to say? Sometimes you make the make the accuracy. It depends. Higher or sometimes lower, or it depends. So um, I'm not. So the accuracy is not um, what during calculation I'm taking into account. What I'm taking into account is the probability of my classes. So um, the output of my last layer is the probability of which class to actually choose. Mm -hmm. So this is similar to other neural network architectures where the last layer is uh, the size of your mm -hmm. um, class space mm -hmm. and you have the the uh, accuracy uh, not the accuracy but the probability of which class it actually is or belongs to um, in the values at each um, at each um, yeah, um, I don't know the word at the moment. Yeah. So. Um, so basically, it, you you alter that probability to choose another. Yes. Action. Yes. Yes. So when whenever a frame that causes the targeted action is shown to the calculating algorithm, um, it's tries to maximize um, or it calculates the loss between this probability and all the other classes. Mm -hmm. So it slowly sh shifts towards uh, the non-targeted classes, in mm -hmm. this case, uh, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5. Mm -hmm. OK. And as whenever there's a frame that um, is not targeted, um, the loss is pretty low because it tries to uh, it calculates the loss between um, 
the prediction, which is, for example, zero, and the actual class, which is zero. Mm -hmm. So this means you have basically a, a random walk or something like this between a certain subgroup of classes mm -hmm. the, that are highly, uh, highly uh, rewarding and the others you keep like they are. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things is that you basically hide a lot of attacks in, in small pieces here, yeah. which makes it look more natural. The other thing that a player might do that looks very natural, like a real player, you know, like, like something that you would get in. And, and I think we know all this. Over time, playing a game means you're getting good at it. Yeah. But there's this certain small situation in the game where you know you could have done better. But you didn't because you, you were distracted or you have been playing for five hours or whatever. So this basically means you make a mistake and a big mistake. That could also look very, very natural. Would that be a, another way of, of a natural attack? Because it basically looks like you're doing great all the time, mm -hmm. but then you're doing something catastrophic. Yeah, this is already implemented um, as um, attention-based adversarial attack. So it tries to find um, a time. Yeah, there's a attention-based method and there's also a time-based method. So it tries to identify the frames that are the frames in time that are somewhat crucial to um, have a good performance and only calculate the perturbation for these specific mm -hmm. um, frames. So this is already implemented. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so to give you a summary of what um, current issues there are with my master thesis, uh, for me, the attacks don't look natural. So yes, they are natural in a way that they are not visible, and they lower the performance to a somewhat nat natural and uh, stealthy approach or attack. Um, but what my original thought of my master thesis would be to have perturbations that are not very small, but form like other cars in the lane or change the image so much that the lane, for example, goes somewhere completely different. And I'm not there yet, and I don't believe that I will uh, achieve this in the next three months. Um, and that is, of course, a problem. And I have to fight in the masterpiece why I don't, why I didn't achieve this and why I think this is problematic or where the problem actually mm -hmm. lies. Um, and the attack is for a transition. Um, as I'm, I've shown you on the four grayscale images on, and not on the single RGB image. Um, and this is a problem because I am not able to produce videos with the attack. Mm -hmm. So I can only apply the attack right before um, the action is predicted and not already um, when I receive the frame from the environment. So I have to change the environment and I have to change my, right. my perturbation because I want to have the perturbation in the video already. Mm -hmm. um, I want to have the per perturbation on top of each frame that I get from the environment already and I don't want to um, plug the perturbation in right before the calculation. Um, to produce videos from the environment that are already attacked. Would, would it be possible, feasible, and, and I mean, is this all deterministic? I can, as in, in principle, I think I can do this. But at the moment, I'm struggling with my implementation skills in PyTorch. So I, I'm not able to, um, to, back, to backward through um, up until the original RGB perturbation. 
and that's what I'm currently struggling with. So okay. in, in general, this is possible. I, I strongly, strongly believe, and my supervisor said it should be possible, but I'm currently struggling with implementation. Okay. So at the moment, I'm working on this, um, and I try to, to add the perturbation to each frame instead of each transition. And another way is to couple the, the training of the perturbation already with the training of the agent receiving the perturbed frames. So somewhat an, an adversarial training coupled with the training of the perturbation itself, uh, which is somewhat similar to how uh, generative adversarial networks work, at least from my understanding. And this is how I want to maybe achieve the natural looking perturbations. So while um, the algorithm uh, producing the perturbation and the algorithm training my agent are in this min-max game and uh, trying to be better than the other part, uh, I hope that my attack will become natural. But I'm working on it and I don't know if I will finish it. Is this a visualization problem or would the, or if you implement what you said there, will the actual attack change? So will the training then change? Um, or is it just visualization? The attack will change. Okay. And I think this will also have an impact on the training. I would, I would think personally, think, and I'm not sure if this is true, but my, my feeling would be that even if you change that, your attacks might not look natural. Yeah. For the very, for the very important reason that the model you're building is pixel-based. Yeah. So this means that the information that you encode is not based on a segmentation of the image. So you're not identifying road lines as a specific entity or other cars as a specific entity in, in, your, in your training model, in your standard model. They are actually because um, of the convolutional layers. So... No. No, I don't think so. I don't. I don't think so. You might. They might play an important role, but their representation is not the same as in a visual sense. I would highly doubt this. Otherwise, you would find the cars in the original training and the lanes in the original training data. You know, you would. You you would have some kind of attention maps or something that tell you look at the car look at the lanes and so on yes, yes. but it would not it would it would yeah but, but they are like stochastic you know they're not it would not look like the track would really bend to the right i would doubt that it would not look like the track is a continuous representation because you have to know that the track in the next image mm -hmm. look just look at the track yeah. You have some form of kinematics. So if the track bends to the right in the next 10 images, because I'm going right now, I also, the track has to stay on the right. You know, this yeah. really takes a lot of track information in the future. And you're just looking at the next image. And in the next image, it might be more beneficial to bend the track to the left again. But now you're changing, you're changing the future. Yeah. So what you're doing is basically the track that looked like it was going to the right would now go to the left. And since you don't have that information, that it should not, because if in the last image it bent to the right, it would be, become very visible that the track does somewhat like that, which it shouldn't do. Because in the game, the, the overall idea is that the track goes right, then left again, then right again in a certain manner. And if it does this, why... What in very fast while things are not moving, yeah. this is a serious thing, and it would have, I would assume this is the same thing with the cars. Yeah. So you would have to have some kind of track model and some type of car model mm -hmm. that is that is basically describing what those things are doing, 
and you could attack this, but this would go much more into the game and into the physics, so to say, of the game. Yeah. Then, then you're uh, you're about to to succeed. So my suggestion would be, from my feeling here, is that this, for the time that you have, is a road you won't be able to to take. Yes, probably. <laughs> yeah. Which is which is not which is not bad because I would turn it around, you know. The the one thing would actually be to show a game that still follows all the physics that you're assuming, but it's much harder to play than the original game. Mm -hmm. Or you say, okay, I'll I'll take the physics as is, but kind of like perturb the input. That's more your approach. And in terms of both scalability and ability to actually attack such a system, your approach is much more robust because going into the physics of the game and really altering that is highly intrusive because if the physics must still look right, the rules must still follow the original rules, but it must be altered in such a way that it becomes ridiculously hard to play the game. While on the other hand, basically making playing the normal game a bit harder by making the actions more random in a certain way uh, is much easier and much more universal because your knowledge on the actual physics of the game has to be less. So that would be my approach to, yeah. to, discussing, to discussing this difference. Because if you would now put this to Pong or Breakout or anything else, again, the knowledge of what is possible within the game in order to really create a situation that looks like it's part of the game, but it's just much harder, must be much bigger, much, 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 much bigger yeah. than, than just hiding a, a bit of random noise and, and making it possible, you know? Okay, okay. So, so that would be yeah. my my way of 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 describing that. Yeah. So in the in the very very beginning of my master thesis, I tried to to generate um, images with um, a generative adversarial network, and it kind of worked out that I could create images that looked like the game images. But still, I I had the problem in mind. Okay, but how do I make this? look like we are actually in the current state of the game. And then I thought about, okay, there are some methods called partially adversarial attacks and so on. I wanted to add an, an alpha channel to all the images and just add single perturbations to it. But the problem is that you have to really understand yeah. a time series here yeah. that includes all the rules that are specific to the game. And at all time, you know? There is a generative model from, I, it's either NVIDIA or DeepMind. I, I think it's NVIDIA that can create Atari images that a human can play. So they are a bit of kind of noisy, but they have the physical information of the game inside them. So even if you, if you um, for example, play Pac-Man and um, you, your Pac-Man is leaving through one side of the level and entering again on the other side, it is on the same height. So it has the information about this, but I don't think that in the last three months of my thesis, I can perform an attack. It would require much more data because it has to learn all the rules implicitly decoded in encoded in the game. That's just much more. What you're actually doing right now is adding some random noise that does almost the same thing. And what you now have to do is tweak that noise to make it as invisible as possible. It is. And, and and this is natural enough in the sense, as I'm saying, the, the, the one thing is the broken controller, and that's what you're implementing. Yeah. The other thing is to really 
you know, replace the game by something that looks exactly like the game, but is just so much harder, you know, like a like a brutal end boss level maximum force <laughs> instead of instead of just saying, OK, my controller is broken. And if I would pl play something like this, I would also first go to the controller because uh, now, now applying this to another system like a real car. Again, implementing something that looks like reality to the car and that looks a lot like reality is a much harder task than just putting some easily undetectable random noise somewhere that really kicks the car. However, the second approach is also, I would say, finally something that could be mitigated. Because if you have a robust algorithm and you're attacking it with some random noise, then you could always try to make the, um, the algorithm so robust that it does not really see the random noise, that it tries to take care of most of it and only at a certain point where you have so much random noise that it becomes visible anyways that you have an attack, then the system would probably fail. So this is like robust optimization. You say, okay, I'm not, I'm not stirred by anything because it changes from frame to frame. I just keep going, assuming that this is wrong mm -hmm. and just playing the game and saying I'm growing straight. While uh, if I really see that this goes like this all the time, I'm, un I'm either on an enduro track with my car or uh, I'm in a situation where I'm being attacked. Yeah. So, so to me, I think the, the, the attack you're trying to achieve in your master thesis would, would be to alter reality. Yes. And that's not Which possible. is a very <laughs> nice thing to do. But... <laughs> Maybe it was too, too ambitious, but yeah, still, um, I want to to try um, out what I've written in these points. Is the, is the, is the source code for this available? Yes. For the, not for your work, but for, for the game. For the game. Um, it is somewhat implemented in the Atari learning environment. So it must be in there. Because that's the only way what you, you would, would basically use the game as a renderer mm -hmm. for reality and you would capture the rules. That would be the only other attack. Okay. Mm. Yeah, but I don't know if I'm able to. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> um, this is not part of your master thesis. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't know how these images are rendered, you know, that's finally what's the, the images are rendered based on pretty simple rules that you want to attack. But what you now want to do is attack those pretty simple rules by the very complex rendering of those. That, I mean, that's the whole idea why this was so great as, an, as a game, because the actual game to, to, to draw and to make is pretty simple. It just doesn't require a lot of computational power, but the rendering of that situation puts you in an almost realistic environment. You know, the street bends, it's 3D, it's other cars behaving like other cars. And so this was all great, you know? But, but the, the, the idea, like, like the Wii controllers, the Wii controllers are doing the exact same thing. They're putting you in an environment as a human They're telling you now you have to move the stick like a tennis racket or a basketball. Well, in reality, it's just that stupid movement, okay? But you're getting tricked. And, and I think what you wanted to achieve with your master thesis is just too hard to do that. Yes, yes, probably. But that's not bad. That's you can. I would turn it around, and I would say once I have realized it, I can formulate what would be extremely hard to do. You would basically have to re-implement the game based just on the image data, mm -hmm. with all its rules that look all natural, and then change them so it becomes hard to play. So you would basically 
need to learn the entire game and make it absolutely look natural. Yeah. While still being harder than before. Okay. <laughs> and that you have to formulate. Yeah. This is basically one path and it leads to totally simulating a real reality that's just for some reason harder than our actual reality. Yeah. Or you just hide something that's much easier to hide somewhere in reality yeah. and get almost the same effect. Yes. Yes. So you're being more efficient and more robust to other situations because Pong has another reality yeah. than, than, than Breakout has another reality than Pac-Man and so on. And usually with these perturbations that um, I, for example, produce, um, they can be uh, applied to other environments too. So exactly. I haven't tested it yet because I had um, no working other agent yet um, until yesterday. Um, but <coughs> if I uh, put this perturbation in particular on top of, for example, a, a Pong or a breakout transition, uh, it should have an input as, uh, an, an impact as well, but I don't know how much how much it will affect it, because um, for all the models, um, the neural networks find patterns in noise that are not they are there, but they are not important to to the human eye. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the neural nets, they somewhat are. And that's why computer vision is not very robust and not very suitable for driving Teslas around. So, well, the Teslas have mainly computer vision, don't they? Yes. <laughs> and that's why I specifically say Tesla. Uh, one more question. Now, you would go with the same perturbation in another game, or would you retrain the perturbation specific for that game? I would retrain the perturbation for that specific game, but still, uh, the perturbation for Enduro should also have an impact on Pong or Breakout. Of course, every perturbation should have an impact, yeah. whether it's large or would would. How so you would retrain all the time? Would there be a transfer learning ansatz maybe, maybe for that? Maybe, but the uh, functions are so simple and so fast, it doesn't make a huge difference in computation time. It would I, because I don't um I don't have a model that creates the perturbation, it's just a function. Okay. For, for me, one of the interesting questions would be would be, there be game independent perturbations, you know, like universal yeah. perturbations. Then that, that's where maybe a transfer learning approach might be interesting that yeah. takes into account more than one game. But um, there is only one agent known um, in literature that is that has been trained on multiple uh, Atari games and is successful with them. That's Ag Agent 53 by... Um, <laughs> by <laughs> um, Why not 51? There is a missed opportunity yeah. here. <laughs> 42 would have been also good. But um, yeah, for this agent, one could calculate a universal perturbation for all Atari games. But at the moment, I'm not... Um, I'm not able to do it. Bye bye, Ulrik. Um, yeah, um, but at the moment, I'm not able to calculate a really universal attack on okay. many games. Okay. Okay. Yeah, summary I think we have said everything. Um, References and thank you. Perfect. Thank you so Wonderful much. talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Very I, I think there are some things I can definitely um, 
I should have included some. some I, I think one, one of the slides that was clearly missing was explaining what all the different things did, you know, just explaining the rules of the game once mm -hmm. in such a in such a thing is a good thing, you know, even I didn't remember all of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I should have, should have played this one. <laughs> one slide. But I played this, played this on the original, not even on the TV. Yeah. There were also, there were also consoles, so yeah. I remember it is very strong. Can you do chocolate for me? I can. <laughs> <laughs> is it so good in the, in the, in the so no, it was actually the ch chocolate cake was the was the uh, Mac or the, 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 the Apple version of the Atari. Uh, what was it called? Atari. I don't know that. But... Yeah, there are several other games included in, in the gym environment um, from Open AI. So you can you can play Flappy Bird with reinforcement learning. You can play Doom with. Okay. Reinforcement learning. You can even play Minecraft with you, uh, reinforcement learning. So it's yeah, it's open. You can add your own environments to it. Mm. Um, yeah, but the, I, I think it's really fascinating to to see how the agent from the simple uh, input frames learns what to do. Mm. And that's really nice. It's it's wonderful work. It's a wonderful work, and I, I would say you you shouldn't be you shouldn't be sad that you didn't alter reality. I think you you uh, you you did the more robust approach that is more universal in many senses. Yes, um, but adversarial attacks uh, with this noise are um, easy to mitigate. They are easy to mitigate. They have been uh, researched extensively. Um, they are nothing new. And that's why I was a bit down in the beginning that I wasn't able to, <laughs> to do the other stuff. That I've well, but you should make clear in your thesis what, why the other stuff is harder. Yeah. You know? And, and making it look natural is still an important prerequisite, you know? Yeah. Is that is because otherwise you would need a full work model. You need to generate all the frames. That is hard. Yeah. Or or you would focus on just one car or something, or on your own car. Mm -hmm. So you take part of that reality. Yeah, but then you have to to determine where the car is at the moment, exactly. determine the frame around it, and so on. And I have this one, but uh, it's, not, it's not so easy. No, it's not easy. Absolutely not. Okay. okay, okay Any more know. questions? I'm sorry, that was a lot of questions from my side. The, the, are, are the others still there? Are you still alive? <laughs> okay, obviously not. A real on me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so, since this was a, damn it, I hate these privacy browser, browsers. Um, so, I would propose to have a, to, to have a, I'm, I'm giving out a paper seminar problem. And whoever takes it should probably be, um, um, either a computer scientist or a person from Warm Dance Manor. And um, this is a paper I would like to see discussed. Um, let me just quickly find it again. Uh, do, 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 oh, I hate this. Exactly, it's a 2005 PRL. Uh, Max or, or uh, Tobias, are you still there? Otherwise, I'm going up to you. I'm still here. Yeah, okay. So maybe I'll come to here. you and, and propose this as for, for you guys. It's a paper you probably have read, but nevertheless, it would be very beneficial to, to also 
uh, be understandable to our uh, uh, computer scientists. And it discusses, it's the, it's the 2005 uh, um, uh, uh, physical review letter on the sign problem in uh, in uh, understanding um, the fermionic uh, in, in fermionic quantum Monte Carlo simulation, and it basically pr uh, proves that this is an NP hard problem. So your master the your uh, uh, your PhD thesis is solving an NP hard problem. <laughs> <laughs> So this is something I would like to see at one point in the paper reading seminar because it shows that that looking at such problems uh, with algorithms is still fruitful, even though some people show that it is really, really hard. <laughs> okay. Um, are, there any, and are there any more questions to Pia for now? If that is yes, not maybe. the case... Maybe, maybe I, if, if I may. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to say I very enjoyed the presentation and the topic. Uh, maybe I wanted to ask um, how the reward uh, is calculated based on the, of the pixel input. Like, uh, I understand that, um, that the game is not happening in like one frame, but uh, if you do something, uh, it will make a change in like next few hundred or tens of frames. So it's just from one frame to the second frame revert or uh, yeah. how this is done. Um, so the environment I'm working with is um, the open AI gym environment. It's uh, a framework for uh, reinforcement learning purposes. And um, they, um, so if we go back to the to the slide, no, uh, this one, yeah. So after each action, so for each frame you receive back from the environment, um, the environment also returns a reward. And for enduro, for example, the the racing game, um, the reward is always zero. Um, while no car is passing or even near. And as soon as the player surpasses one opponent, uh, the environment um, um, returns a plus one for this specific frame only. And if the player gets surpassed by other opponents, it will receive a minus one reward for the specific frame. So but it's, still it's, it's like uh, finding a best uh, combination of actions to, to get to this reward as fast as possible or? No, but only for one frame. You're not looking for, the, you're not making like a, like a history of actions. That would I like, you know, like wanted to ask chess. for. In like yes, uh, I was I was thinking about chess that you can you can like uh, make one move and get a reward because you like uh, uh, took a figure of your enemy, but uh, it can lead to the to the loss. Yeah. In like three other moves. Yeah. Um, of course, enduro might seem um, simple in that case because um, one can actually take a look at each frame and see whether um, the plus one reward is in your sight or not. Okay. Um, and adding the past transition helps with the calculation of the future reward, of course. But there are other games that have really sparse rewards, uh, especially since for Atari games, um, it is necessary to clip the reward to be between minus one and one. Um, there are games where you only receive a reward after five minutes of gameplays, a positive reward after five minutes of gameplays of play. And it is really hard to um, get there 
with random actions so that the agent actually sees what to do. But still with this algorithm that I have been using, this is possible. So it somewhat learns how to receive the reward, even if rewards are sparse. Okay, so you was uh, you are not defining uh, time span um, like in, in that uh, the reward was calculated, right? I mean, like setting yeah. the number of frames. Uh, so you're not you're only taking the last frame and the current frame, and not ten frames in the future or something. Okay. Yeah, okay. but frames in this case for the Atari agent always includes the past four frames. So it's not a frame and the next frame, it's the transition and the next transition. Okay, but it would probably, this, this game is very much forward. So why should it be the last four and not the future four, for example? Because um, it has to learn how it, how it gets there. So if the car has been in the middle of the lane, for example, um for, for the past few frames and there's nothing in front um the possibility uh, or the, the likelihood for choosing the action one to accelerate should be much higher than every other mm. and it, it has to somewhat um have this knowledge about the past I would I would think that it, this is important for learning, but to really be more efficient, it should also be having a knowledge of the future, which should like it should find that back in the past, you know, like an action of sequences that leads to a reward rather than one action, you know. It's it's like chess. You're 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 going finally from many possibilities to one best action. So there have been approaches to um, extend the agent algorithm with LSTMs. So uh, changing the network architecture from uh, only convolutional layers of the model to actually include uh, recurrent neural net layers. Mm -hmm. So uh, long short-term memory, LSTM, or um, GRU cells uh, that are known to inhibit some kind of history mm -hmm. and maybe even the future. Um, they, there have been approaches to this already. So mm -hmm. yes, okay. this is possible. Okay. Any other? Thanks very much, Adam. That was a very helpful question. Anything else? Okay, if that's not the case, Pia, thank you very much. That was really a very nice talk. Thank you for your and, and I think it was inspiring a lot of thoughts. Thank you very much. Nice work. Thank you. Perfect.